I'm Rebecca and this is my journey going from no aviation experience to my private pilot certificate. Thank you so much for watching. This is Instructor Brad and he's going to do his best to cover parasitic drag and juice drag, dissymmetry of lift, P factor, forces in flight and adverse yaw. I feel sorry for him already. There's four forces in flight. Do you remember what those are? Just talked about um, drag. Okay, that's one of them. So you've got the opposing thrust. Thrust, yes, ma'am. Um, lift. Lift. And gravity. Gravity. That's <laughs> right. I mean weight. Lift from the wings, thrust from the engine-powered propeller, and drag, slowing the airplane down. One more thing I want to talk about. I want to talk about adverse yaw. When we turn this airplane, let's say we're flying along straight and level, and all of the forces are in equilibrium. Our thrust equals drag, and our lift equals weight, or opposes gravity, right? Mm -hmm. So we're flying straight and level, and we're in unaccelerated flight. Everything's in a nice equilibrium. Then I decide, you know what? I want to disrupt that equilibrium. I want to turn the airplane to the left. How do we turn the airplane to the left? We have to do two things, right? What's the first thing we do? Turn the ailerons. Turn the ailerons to the left, which causes the airplane to do what? Roll. Roll or bank right. to the left. Yeah. Correct? Now, when I do that, I'm using what flight control surface to do that? The ailerons. The ailerons. So I'm placing one aileron up into the airflow this way mm -hmm. and one aileron down into the airflow over here, which causes the airplane to bank. Mm -hmm. Now, if we just use just the ailerons, the airplane would not effectively turn. What we're wanting to do is we're wanting to take some of the vertical component of lift that's causing us to maintain our equilibrium in flight. We're taking some of that vector away from the vertical component of lift and we're placing it into the horizontal component of lift, which causes the airplane to turn. Do you remember what the second thing we have to do when we, we bank the airplane? We also have to do something else maybe with the rudder pedals. Yeah, really. We have to step on the ball, right? Yeah. I am currently doing ground training at the same time as practical flying. I'm doing Sporty's online syllabus and I've been reading a lot about stalling by exceeding the angle of attack. So any questions so far? Um, in the ground training for this lesson I've read a lot about angle of attack. Yes. Okay. And obviously it talks about you can stall at any speed that the angle attack is essential. Like, how do you know, well, we've talked about weights and balance. How do you know the different angle of attack difference depending on how heavy you are? And right, so angle of attack is what is critical. Yeah. This airplane, you're, you are correct, can stall at any airspeed mm -hmm. and any, any, uh, any altitude. What is critical is that you've got the relative wind that's flowing over the airflow, over the airfoil, coming at the leading edge of the wing, going to the trailing edge of the wing. If you change that angle of attack and you exceed what is called the critical angle of attack, the airflow going over the top of that wing becomes turbulent and is no longer what we call laminar. It's not attached or flowing smoothly over the top of the wing. If that air that's going over the top of the wing is no longer smooth and laminar, it's all turbulent, it's not effective at generating low pressure anymore here. If we're not generating low pressure, this high pressure can't work, so the, it's established an equilibrium between these two and the wing is no longer working. It doesn't work anymore when you exceed that critical angle of attack. How do you know what that critical angle of attack is? It varies. It varies based on weight, mm -hmm. center of gravity of the airplane, outside air temperature and density altitude. All of those things affect how that wing performs. Brad will be demonstrating stools later on in the practical part of the lesson. Did that answer your question? Good question. Angle of attack. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? Let's go do it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go do it. All right, cool. Hicks traffic, Cessna 6291 Golf, now departing runway 14, left close pattern, Hicks traffic. Okay, so I'm going to give you the flight controls again.
I'll line up here on the runway. And the wind is a little bit from the left. So we're going to hold this like this. And then right hand on the throttle. Left hand on the control wheel. And let's push the throttle in. And we guide the aircraft down the center line with the rudder pedals. All the way in with the power. And we bring out some of this aileron. Just right about here. Looking for the airspeed to come alive. Okay, our airspeed's not coming in alive. Let's abort the takeoff. We don't have an airspeed indicator. No, we don't. Uh -huh. Hicks traffic, 629 or 1 to Golf, aborting the takeoff. Abort, 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 runway 14. Hicks. Got it. Although I didn't know at the time, this is one of the most memorable and teachable points. Um, it's really important to know what you're doing in the airplane, but also why you're doing it, so that you can notice when things are not working properly. So we head back to the hangar, get the airspeed indicator checked over, and are able to head straight back out on the same day to continue our lesson. How do we test it? Just that the red flag is missing, and when we're taxiing, I'll taxi a little bit. I have the flight controls. You have the flight controls. Watch, watch what happens as I'm taxiing. So I'm going to go up this way, and then I'm going to make a, one of my right, see it banking to the left because I'm making a left turn. Okay. Watch when I make this right turn here, and you'll watch it. It'll really turn, and this wingtip will come down this way. I'm already asking questions in a different way. I know that my checklist says look through the instruments. And I know I should be looking at my turn coordinator, but what am I looking for? And so Brad is able to demonstrate that as we taxi to our ne next departure. We're going to head out into the practice area and I'm going to start looking just at the turn coordinator as Brad demonstrates adverse yaw. I'm in coordinated, unaccelerated flight right now. I'm in level flight and everything's in equilibrium. Okay. Now I want to make a right hand turn. As I make a right hand turn, and if I don't step on the ball, the ball is going to go out to the left as I make a right hand turn, and that's that adverse yaw. So I'm clear to the right, don't see anybody, and as I roll into the right turn, watch what happens. See, the airplane now is uncoordinated because the ball is out here to the right. I have to step on the ball to make it coordinated. And now Brad is going to truly answer my question about exceeding the angle of attack. I've increased the angle of attack, yep. which decreases my speed. Yep. Look out there and look at the angle of attack from the horizon to the wing. See how high it is? Yep. Whereas if I put the power in and I maintain the same airspeed, Level. see how it's changed? Yep. So I'm changing the angle of attack. So what I'm going to do at some point, if I change the angle of attack to where it's too high, I start to get a star warning horn, right? Yep. And again, now that I've got a high angle of attack, I have to add that right pedal. There's the star warning horn. It says, hey man, you're getting too slow. I have to lower the nose to make the sound go away. See, the sound went away because I lowered the nose because I changed my angle of attack. Yep. So if I go too low, if I go too low and I hold it up there, it will stall. Now, this, this will tickle your tummy a little bit. Okay. So I'm going to indicate what happens when the wing stalls. You'll feel a buffet, it'll go boop, boop, and then the nose is going to drop. Boop, boop, boop. There it is, the nose drops. I have to lower the nose to get the airplane flying again. So is the, the, but the nose is lowering itself anyway? It is because the engine's so, heavy. Okay, so it kind of could recover on its own potentially? It sure will. Exactly. Watch. Let me demonstrate. Okay. So I'm clear to the left, clear to the right. I want to turn to the left. We're going to go back to 3,000 because I don't like to do stalls below 3,000. Now you're not sick, are you? Because I know that all this turning and stuff tends to upset your stomach. How are you doing? You okay? I'm doing good, but I'm not 100% happy. I know, me either. <laughs> it's hot out here, and, and, and you know, this is not fun. Okay, so um, what I'm going to demonstrate is if we just let go of the airplane after I've got it into a stall, yeah. and the airplane will recover if I just let go of everything. Now, it may go off to the right. It may go off to the left. We don't know, but it will recover. 
Do you see any airplanes out there on your side? I don't see any. No. And I don't see any up this way. Okay, I don't see any, I don't hear any. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate how the airplane will recover itself because it is inherently stable. This airplane wants to fly yeah. as long as it has, it's designed this way. Yeah. You have to get the nose down though because if you keep holding the nose up, the airplane engine doesn't have enough power to make us fly straight up. Okay. Eventually it runs out of power and you have to reduce the critical angle of attack otherwise the wing stops working. Right. So when the wing stops working, we get a stall warning first. The stall warning comes on and it says, hey, hey dummy, lower the nose, but I'm really stupid. So I don't lower the nose and I go, what? Oh no, we're stalled. I let go of it. It starts flying again. It does. So if you ever get into like a it's situation... Like it's made to fly. <laughs> like it's made to fly. And, and, and that's exactly right. It's designed to fly. Yeah. If you held it in that position, which you can do, you can hold it in that position and hold it there and just and it'll just kind of go like this. This keeps... But you'll be descending. Yeah. I'll demonstrate. That's okay. You sure? <laughs> I can hold it there. I can. I'm not making you sick, though. I don't want to do that. Okay, so I'm going to... One more time and then okay. we'll give it up. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hold it in a stall condition, holding it straight ahead. There's the stall. There's the stall. We're still stalled. We're still stalled. We're still stalled. We're still stalled. Look at this. We're still stalled. Oh, wow. See? Feel it buffeting? Yeah. It's, the wing is not working. It's saying, hey, wait a minute. What's going on here? But, it, but it's still visually, it looks better. Oh, because yeah. Because it's always counterproductive to, to do some of the nose down activities. But if you get into a stall condition, just release the back pressure and the airplane starts flying again because yeah. the airspeed comes back. Yeah, absolutely. But it's interesting that when you're holding in stall, visually it feels better than when, it's, when you're recovering the stall. Right. This is not really what Brad wants me to get out of this exercise. He wants me to understand that if I push the, pull the controls, it's going to make it worse. If I push the nose down, then you can recover from a stall. I'm super glad to be back on the ground. And I get to close down the engine and walk away. Everyone safe and happy. Okay, so let's do a shutdown checklist. Oh. Yep, avionics, all four of them. One, two, Four, and then press and hold. So I guess technically there's five. Okay. Okay, so that's here, right? That's okay. When you, when you pull it out, the engine's gonna stop, right? Okay. Because it's red, so we think about it before we move it.